I was the Minister for Natural Resources and Tourism. We were in Berlin, and you guys had all this nice stuff to talk, and I was there, yes. So prior to that, though, you were in the banking sector. So tell us about the transition from private sector to, to government first off. What, what led you there? Okay. I think deep inside me, I'm a politician, okay? All along, I went into banking sector early in my life and did the banking, investment banking and all that was, I had a desire to make money like everybody else. But then I have enormous passion for politics and African politics, so joined politics for some years, re-elected as a member of parliament four times. That makes me, I was the youngest, so don't, please don't judge me. Um, I had a pleasure to serve as a parliamentarian and then cabinet member yeah. um, for a few years in Tanzania, five years to be yeah. precise, and, and after that I went back to the private sector and I'm very happy to be, to be where I am right now. So what attributes then make a good politician from a banking sphere? What, what, if you thought that like, why you, was that? You understand, I think the key thing that people need to understand is politics is synonymous of business. And usually, I was interviewing today with CNBC, and governments are always coming and asking businesses or anybody, what is there for me? So usually it's more taxes and more taxes and more spending and more spending and more taxes. So if it is growth for the hospitality industry, yeah. it's been diminished because some of the public policies are really not for pro-growth, pro-private sector. Okay. Uh, most people coming into government sectors believe that you got to promise more okay. and more, and when it comes to delivering, you have to ask more in terms of taxes, and that has enormous implications. So coming into politics, one thing I realized and I knew was you need to, you need to make governments a little bit smaller. You need to allow people to keep most of their money in their own pockets. Yeah. You need to allow whatever that you earn, whether it's pay as you earn or whether it's corporate taxes, reasonably smaller so that companies can continue to invest some more. You create that stability. And I think coming into government sector with that knowledge and being part of what I did as a minister, one of the things we did, I think my Kenyan counterparts will understand, was to reduce uh, all these gazillion taxes, when you come to Tanzania, you will be charged one, two, three, four, so many taxes on the same thing, so we reduce them. I cannot really attest now, I am private citizen, so I wouldn't talk for the government, but what I can assure you is that every time policymakers focus on reducing taxes, uh, making it simpler for people to do businesses, it allows for private sector to flourish, yep. whether medium scale businesses or large. And I think this is something that we are talking here in Africa and it should be reflected all across the board. What, was, um, what were you most proud of during your time as Minister of Tourism? What were you most proud of achieving? The same question was asked of me when I appeared to uh, Stephen Sack at BBC Hard Talk. What is it that made me proud? We were in the height of the elephant poaching mm -hmm. crisis in Africa. There were so many devils who would do the same thing, blames, and I think at that particular time we teamed, my, one of my job, one of my moment of pride was teaming up with my colleagues across Africa uh, to really address the issue of poaching. Uh, not only going after those bad guys, quote unquote, yeah. but also making sure the communities were sensitized, they were involved, mm -hmm. they were given ownership, and we realized once communities, members of communities understand there is something for them yep. in terms of this equation of conservation, uh, they, they came forth and they, they really delivered more than the government. So I believe uh, what, I, what I'm proud of it was to, to kind of bring the public sector work hand in hand with the communities and that we involve the private sector to invest uh, both in money, yeah. skill and manpower to kind of make this a collaborative effort and it, it made all of us proud. I think governments in the region, I think, uh, are continuously continuing to, uh, to address to, to those address same that, issues. Yes. That issue as we saw earlier today. Um, yeah. So now you've moved into private sector, why, why was the time right to, to do that for you? When I, when I left the public sector, 
And I think I'm going to go back. You know, politicians are always taking a break, and you say, I will be back. Once a politician. That's how we do it, most. Yeah. OK. I will be back. So be, be careful. Uh, before, I, <laughs> before I go back, and I remember uh, 20, 2015, I ran for president uh, within, within my own uh, huge political parties. And one of us had to get that primary competition. You know, it's beautiful. You, you speak to people. You say what you think. And then you lose. You're like, oh, I lost. So um, I joined the private sector for now, and uh, I had a dream about what is it that matters. So you have communities across the country. One of the things that is happening is the completely destruction of wildlife corridors. Uh, I, I can speak for Tanzania and a few other countries that I, yeah. I work or interact. Yeah. And it was the, the, the main key thing is when members of communities are not being uh, stakeholders properly, yeah, they, they don't care. Yeah. So we came up with an idea of establishing eco lodges. These are very small lodges. Mm -hmm. We would hire what entirely. What sort of size are they? Would give some description. We, we would do like 20, 20 rooms mm -hmm. or 20 cottages. Yeah. We would hire entirely from the communities. The Maybe community. we have, you know, an accountant or some few manage managerial uh, people who are from, you know, somewhere else. We would train these people. Yeah. We involve members of the communities to, uh, to be part of what we call village game scouts. Yeah. So some of them are just going around making sure elephants are not going to hurt somebody. And because usually in these game areas, key thing is you have, you have conflict. You have, you have human wildlife conflict. Yeah. So participation by the community really is becoming very impressive. And we are seeing success, success not only on the numbers of the And they see are, the benefit of? They see the benefit, and we make, we make some money. So my desire is to, to use that opportunity to continue to invest in small ecologies yeah. uh, in some of these unusual places. So we, we can actually go to a Maasai community completely between Arusha, Longido, heading to, 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 the, to the Serengetis. Okay. Somewhere in the middle, you have a huge chunk of land. And there are opportunities. Once we find water, we can you know, we can have business. I think it's flourishing pretty good, yeah. So how, how long has this been going on for you now? So It is basically a startup, and a I startup. love startup. Yeah, we started, we have now three lodges. Okay. Uh, in this tourism season, we had occupancy rate of, of 75%. Uh, we thought that was very, very good, and they are not, they are not necessarily cheap, so 75% okay. occupancy rate, not bad for the startup. So. Okay, so you've been in this for a short period of time since being, if you were looking at yourself in a mirror now and you saw uh, on one side, this side is the chairman of Waverley, the, the private sector man, and in the mirror you're talking to your public sector self, what would you be asking yourself to do to support the industry? Okay, key thing that I do, I speak to a lot of my colleagues, to members of government in my own country or or, or those in leadership from other countries in Africa, I emphasize, make sure you work on, that, on the tax regime because it's important. It's important to simplify how we tax the industry. And the numbers that are coming through tourism industry seem to be large. The profit margins are small. Right. And they tend to confuse policymakers to believe that we can go after the hotels and tax them gazillion times. We can go after all these uh, properties or, or anybody who is into this industry, whether those that are providing the transportation, uh, other logistics. So key thing is, I believe my experience is, showing, is telling me we can work with public sector, government and others to make sure they are a completely, uh, they, they understand yeah, yeah. that for them to make more money, they have to allow for this industry to flourish in, this, in the form in which it is and that can be more sustainable. Taxing is one thing but change is another. So with all of this, is there a change happening in Tanzania that is supporting our industry? I will say two things about Tanzania. I think we've made a lot of progress. You need to understand by the end of last year, Tanzania tourism sector was attracting about 25% of the, of, the, of, the, of the foreign exchange earnings. And that is a huge number, if you, if you consider. Yeah. And, and, and the tourist number has increased to a little over 1.2 million arrivals. If you consider Zanzibar, you consider uh, the, the mainland Tanzania, I think the progress is being made. And I think the tourism sector in Tanzania is developing very, very fast. Yeah. My, my warning is that 
the public sector is, is our appetite for taxation has gone a little bit more. So because they see the numbers, which are impressive, they come up with all these interesting ideas. So it's and always pulling you back. All in. So local communities and, and, and national governments tend to want more taxes. Yeah. So my, my uh, opinion is uh, we can sustainably develop this sector if we focus on allowing it to grow, yeah. if we focus on governments investing in conservation, it is like creating roads, infrastructure, so that people can pass. Okay. So more and more investment will actually allow more and more numbers to grow. And somebody said earlier on, these assets are, once they are gone, once the space for the wildlife is gone, it's gone forever. And I think one of the key challenges that I think uh, is going to be there for us is wildlife corridors are closing down. Yeah. We are interested in shared ecosystems. For example, Mara and Serengeti, it is very important that these borders are open, not only for the for the for the for the for the people to cross, but also for the for the for the wildlife migration to continue to flourish. It is important that we allow these shared ecosystems within countries to continue to to thrive. Okay. Short of which, you are going to actually have uh, a deadline upon which there will be no more uh, no more pristine areas in this part of Africa it, as it used to be. Uh, do governments actually have the ability to police this adequately, really? I think they think they do. The answer is not. Um, i give you an example. We have Selu Game Reserve in Tanzania. The size of that, 55,000 square kilometer. It's bigger than the entire country uh, of Belgium. Yeah. That is just one park. It's the largest in Africa. So when I was doing the Selu Niasa corridor agreement between Tanzania and the country of Mozambique, I brought the Mozambican together. We sat in Dar es Salaam, we say Niasa is 40,000 square kilometer, Selu alone is 55. Yeah, yeah. This is like several countries combined. And we had how many? We had, I had 500 game rangers in the Selus. Sure, sure. It is like absolutely nothing. So unless members of communities are involved, unless we can be able to find a formula that allow them to benefit from these shared benefits, you really cannot make it. So governments alone, yeah. the answer is they cannot, they so don't you, have the capacity. So your vision is to go get the people. Get the, get people, the people, but get the get business the to come and invest. Yeah. So most businesses are scared, like, yeah, how do I go to Salus, for example? It is the most beautiful, maybe after heaven, after <laughs> most beautiful place. Um, you see some of these natural rivers, and yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just an amazing place. I go there. I, I give you this little story. So I asked the members of the U.S. Special Forces based in Stuttgart, German, to come and help me during the height of the or poaching. I wanted somebody to train uh, the game rangers. So the special guys, special forces guys from America came. They came to the Salus, and they were taken aback by the vastness of the land and how huge this place makes you look very small. Yeah. And, 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 and the, as they were training, the challenges were a lot more than maybe they did in other places like Iraq. But the point here is that we can work together from the expertise, yeah, yeah, yeah. investment, governments, as well as communities. And I would encourage anybody wishing to invest uh, here in Kenya, in Tanzania, or these other parts of Africa, not to be afraid. Yeah. Ask the right questions. You have a lot of people who will actually tell you. I love the story of a lady who presented about Nigeria. It, it is just phenomenal how such a place, yeah. you know, would be equal to some of the places we have in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, or some parts of Mozambique. And, and the reason people tend to say, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. when it comes to investment is because they are afraid. Thou shall not be afraid. Okay, so, so I've never been to heaven. Um, but I'm hoping that the connectivity is as bad as it is in Africa, so I don't get there pretty soon. So um, what's your view of uh, open skies, uh, if you came back as a politician? C briefly, because I want to ask you Oh, so more the, the answer about that is I will definitely come back as a politician. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. so let me say, my open skies is, 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 is an enormous um, idea. I think it is something that must happen in all of the, all, all of the African continent. Yeah. 
we are, one of the reasons we, we, we do not attract enough numbers is because flying into Africa is expensive. If you were to come to Dar es Salaam, to Kilimanjaro, to Central Africa Republic, some of these places, you better go to Europe or America and come back. It is expensive to do business, not only that, but flying between African states and cities. So idea of having an open sky yeah. um, is not only important, but it will allow the thriving of the tourism sector. One of the key things I see is every country believes we must have an airline. Fantastic idea. I think even in heaven, they would like even your own house to have own airline. Here's the thing, aviation is very specific industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it is shared, you have to really pull uh, in, in major centers, you know, like Nairobi and other places, you can have more tourists are being pulled in this part of Africa much better than if we struggled that, you know, we have to have an aviation center in Dar es Salaam, and then those from Mtwara will say we want ours, those from whatever. The aviation industry will have to be consolidated, I believe, in Africa, so that it can really make sense, it can compete globally, it can have the economies of scale that are needed to make it, yeah. you know, economically viable. Uh, and it should not be politicized. So as a former politician on transit to become politician again someday, uh, the idea to you tell the people, I'm going to bring aviation. It is going to be yours. Okay. So they will see a plane coming, a jumbo jet. They're like, yeah, we're going to vote for you. Here's the problem. It's very expensive. It costs money. And eventually, it's not sustainable. So we have to look at ideas of open skies, idea of open partnership globally, and also intra-region partnerships when it comes to aviation. So uh, we've run out of time, but I'm going to ask you one final question, because you mentioned, you keep intimating you're coming back into politi oh, sure. politics. And, and, and your wife is Miss Tanzania, right? She was, former, not now. Former <laughs> she Ms. was, a long time ago. Uh, Miss Tanzania. So the word on the street uh, yeah. is that you may be looking to possibly go into presidency. So if she was the first lady, um, what would you be doing as a president for, for the country? I believe in a few things. I really think public service is a noble thing. It's a noble undertaking. I have seen uh, a lot in politics. Key thing, any, any politician, whether you're president or member of parliament, coming into power, you need to understand that power, one has a limit. You, you start today, you will end tomorrow. So the key thing is legacy. What is it that you want to achieve for the people? And what do you want to be remembered for? If these questions are asked, a lot of politics as we see it in Africa would change. And I think if, it's the, if the focus is about the people and development, uh, most politicians tend to go after after what we call populist agenda. You come up with something that is short term, that will make people you know, clap for you, but there are very little, uh, in most parts we see that have long term view. We want to develop Africa and our individual countries long term. We, we have to have ideas and agenda that could last for 50, 100 years. And I think eventually we're gonna be judged uh, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, about the decisions and the actions we took as politicians today. Fantastic. A great way to end the interview. Thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with the, the, the eco lodges and when you get back to it. With business for now. Yes, yeah, for business for now. Okay, thank you. so thank you so much. Thank you, thank thank you, you so very much. much. Good time.